talk to because they ask the most questions and it takes a lot of pressure off me and making sure that you get what you want just by asking questions and keeping this really interactive. So if you're not familiar with who the Farm Service Agency is, uh, we're just an agency within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We cover a lot of different programs. Um, we have our missions as in disaster relief, um, commodity support, conservation programs, and of course, you know, my specific niche is the loan programs. So, um, so that's what we'll dive into is kind of covering some of these costs of these extension work, uh, season extenders. So um, where we fill in a role is uh, we provide credit if you're unable to obtain commercial credit. So, which is common, uh, startup operations, beginning farmers, things like that. Um, so it might not be that you're, um, uh, it might just be a collateral issue and not a cash flow issue. It might be a tight cash flow margin issue. It might be a commercial industry is unfamiliar with your, uh, with your product and they're just not willing to venture into there. So that's where we kind of fill the void fill the void. Um, that's where Farm Service Agency comes and fills the void is, is a government run program. Um, and we have, and if you have questions for us, we have, how we're set up is I'm in the state office in Lincoln and we have a, a series of dozen specialists there. We kind of run the administrative operations for the loan department. But out of, I think there are 93 counties in Nebraska, we have 71 FSA offices throughout the state. So we're <coughs> everywhere. That's one of our biggest advantages. We have a, a rural footprint. And uh, out of those 71 offices, we have 23 farm loan staff. So farm loan staff may cover three, five, seven counties, depending on where you're at geographically in the state. But so you might not be having one a farm loan team specifically in your county, but you'll have a team that serves your county. So just quick, quick overview. So I said I mentioned that I do direct loans. So when we're talking about direct loans, simply means. You work directly with us. You work directly with the Farm Service Agency. You're going into your local office and you're getting loans there. So farm operating loans, um, that's your loans for if you're doing green line stock, machinery equipment, also your input expenses, those type of loans. Um, a subset of that is youth loans. So if you're 10 to 20 years old, we can make you a $5,000 or less youth loan. And micro loans, which I'll dive a lot more into because that loan program was specifically designed for specialty local producers to kind of get through some of the paperwork burden of the larger um, commodity type operations and, and make our programs more accessible to those folks. Um, the farm ownership program, we have a series of farm ownership loan programs. Those are specifically to purchase real estate or improve real estate. Um, the regular one, there's a down payment one for beginning um, farmers or um, some targeted or served producers, whether they're minorities or women that we're targeting, they can take advantage of that program. Um, joint financing, where we work with a commercial lender to provide financing to purchase real estate. And then just recently, as in within the last 10 days or two weeks ago, we rolled out the direct micro loan program. So um, I'll do my best to answer those questions, but I do want to present that to you because that's a brand new program, um, direct uh, micro loan to purchase real estate. So we also serve emergency, um, have emergency loans that you can potentially take advantage of. Um, on the guaranteed loan, loans, those are loans that you would actually get through commercial credit and the Farm Service Agency would guarantee, work with the lender to guarantee any loss. So we, we entice the lender to make loans by providing a guarantee on those loans. So then in that case, the bank or Farm Credit or something like that would be our, our customer. And uh, a lesser use program that very much to make sure people are aware of is the land contract guarantee. So if you're purchasing a uh, real estate on land contract, we can either guarantee a percent of loss on to the um, seller, or we can guarantee prompt payment up to two or three years of prompt payment. We have a couple options there to uh, incentivize the seller and kind of provide some protection to the seller and incentivize them to uh, purchase sell the ground to you. And then the farm storage facility loans and the commodity loans. Um, Commodity loans are more uh, a marketing assistance loan, more for conventional uh, commodities. But the Farm Storage Facility Loan Program is um, basically for storage and handling. Uh, very, and it's expanded rapidly into cold storage. Um, as of a couple weeks ago, I think the middle of January, we could take um, milk, yogurt, uh, butter, cheese, maple syrup. I'm trying to get creative, but it's anything, uh, hops. 
Um, so they've really wanted to expand to make sure everybody has access to this program. And every time they find a hurdle, they seem to want to roll that into people using this program. And for whether, whatever commodity it is, um, they kind of roll back that hurdle because they want to make sure people have access to the program because it's not getting used up to its funding level. So they want to make sure they roll back some of those restrictions. This is an overview of all the different types of loan programs we have. So just so you have an idea of what we're talking about for interest rates, these are our current interest rates. So the operating microloans, the top, that's 2.625%. And from farm ownership, we are at 3.875%. Um, I talked about if we did a shared credit. So if we're partnering with a lender um, and they're doing up to half, we can go down to 2.5% currently. It's, it's uh, 2% below our, our regular rate. Or if, we, if you qualify for the down payment loan program, um, we go down one and a half, which is four percent below our regular rate, but never below one and a half percent. Um, and then the emergency loan program, and then your guaranteed loan. Um, there's some limits on how high your guaranteed uh, loans can be, uh, your interest rates can be, but those are set based on um, national indexes, and uh, but generally those are negotiated with your. Uh, local lender and we, we usually don't run any lenders that are charging higher than the limits. So. Um, this is just a quick reference chart and I provided there's five fact sheets in the back and as it interests you or as it pertains to you there should be enough for everybody if everybody wants one there is this kind of information available but just a quick the best most consolidated um, access to this information is basically through the chart so if you're talking about a maximum loan type or the rates and terms, and depending on what type of program you're uh, you're interested in, this is the easiest way. Um, I'll just highlight a couple. So the farm ownership loan program, maximum maximum you can get is three hundred thousand. So we can loan three hundred thousand for that, and then the same for direct operating is three hundred thousand. So those are two different three hundred thousand plots. So you can have a three hundred thousand dollar farm ownership loan. And you can have a three hundred thousand dollar operating loan. Um, when we're specifically talking about our microloan program, um, that limits to 50,000. If you need 51,000, you just get bumped into the direct operating loan program and then you got to follow you know, their application requirements and their security requirements that are just a little more stringent than the microloan program. Um, and then just depending on what you're purchasing, um, the amount of real estate or, or anything like that, um, that's where we really get into the participation loans and the down payment loan program. So if you have a 4,000 piece of tract of property that you need to buy, um, we can partner with another lender and make that possible. Um, basically, if we're looking at the participation loan rate, the bank would do, the bank in this example, would do the first uh, $200,000. They'd have a first lien on the property. So we take the, you know, the riskier second lien on the property and have a $200,000 loan as well. And then in that place, we can come at 2.5%. Um, you'll see, and I'll point out, that just in the, there'll be a difference in our direct FO microloan, farm ownership microloan. If you catch me using acronyms, try to stop me. It's, it's, it's ingrained. Um, but we can go up to 40 years on the, uh, on the real estate terms, and it's just a little bit different in the microloan program. So I'll draw that distinction. Yeah? yeah I have a question. Um, sure. How does the program differ for uh, farmers in the rural community as opposed to urban farmers and the urban communities? Sure. Basically, it's the same. Historically, you know, our loans come to where, who, who the farmers have been. But recently, especially with the microloan program, so retrospectively, the microloan program is only four or five years old. But they kind of wanted to roll back, and, and just if you summarize the microloan program, it's reduced application and re in flexible security. So with the microloan program, there's more of an urban ag initiative. Well, I'm speaking more uh, specifically about the direct farm ownership or the ownership participation. Okay. So, so as far as urban ag, we just want to make sure we're loaning to a farm. So there's different agencies that will do housing or, you know, we always rub up against acreages, you know, well, that's a really nice house and I see you have an acre of land around it, but that doesn't make it a farm. But, so we might have that rub, but if you even wanted to buy a lot, or, you know, and I, and I don't know this, what you're picturing, but Urban Ag looks different 
everywhere, you know, and everybody's a different well, example. But I we just could loan for a lot if you get a farm on it. I just know some of these programs are more directly tied to rural farmers than they are to urban farming because urban farming is somewhat of a new animal and the rural farming has always been there. So as these programs have been set up, they've been predominantly set up for the rural farmer. Right. And so as a urban farmer, as I start to exploit some of these different opportunities, I'm wondering if there are roadblocks that I will hit um, because these programs have been set up um, historically for rural areas. Right. No, I can tell So there's no distinction um, between um, you know, a rural farm or an urban farm, there's absolutely no classification of farm. The farm definitions, um, at one point, different programs had like population restrictions. So for example, even up to the last farm bill, maybe farm bill before that, we could do youth loans, but not in communities over 50,000 population. Those all are gone. Okay. So there should be no distinction, you know, so then it just becomes a matter of, and that, that doesn't mean you won't have to come in and educate us on why you have a farm as opposed to a, a house or an acreage or something like that. And that's the common example we get. But um, just like the, the produce guy for the grocery store, you gotta, you gotta tell us what your plan is. As long as we have a farm track number. Yep, and, and, and we're in charge of the farm track number as, as farm service agency. So we can set you up, make sure it's a farm, but you come and say, I'm gonna make this a farm. And then we go through that validation process and do it. But if basically that is that you're farming. I mean that's that's what it is. So it should it shouldn't be a roadblock. So, okay. Yeah. Good question. All right, and then this just kind of fills it in. This is more of the guarantee side, the land contract guarantee and the youth loans. Um, but like I said, the, that's just the best quick reference and just a snapshot view of our programs is through that chart. And there's a, uh, there's a hand out there. Um, so basically, just the quick uh, microloan version. So this started about three or four years ago. I mean, time means nothing to me. But uh, <laughs> it's about three or four years ago, and I could be wrong. It could be five or two, I don't know. Um, but it feels like three or four years ago, we had a microloan operating loan program. So when we're talking about operating, that's your, your farming for the expenses, and then things like machinery, equipment, um, foundation breeding stock, um, things like that. Um, and specifically, kind of rolled back the application requirements to target, um, is, is to target small, beginning, local, um, specialty produce grow, or specialty growers, you know, period. Uh, whether you're, you know, you can market through, we've, we've heard of farmers markets, CSAs, um, you could be, uh, go through grocery stores or trying to do wholesale, something like that. The most you can have uh, is $50,000 to qualify for the microloan program, and then, then all you do, the, you're still eligible for everything, you just bump up into the regular operating loan program. So, um, they, they said more, they defined the definition on what qualifies as a farm, because we have issues where we have, you know, I'll, I'll use the acreage example, and it says, well, I can throw three pumpkins and I can sell those and make $200, that's a farm. And that's why I can. That's why you need this three hundred thousand dollar house. Well, that's not. That's not the purpose of that program. So, uh, <laughs> and that happens. That, so that's what we got to. I, I use the obvious example, but there's a lot of examples like that. So, but they said they use the NAS definition of a thousand dollars gross farm income. So that really gets you qualified as a farm. Um, but there is a, a definition. So, uh, kind of a restrictive layer. So we're not not loaning three hundred thousand dollar for three hundred thousand dollar houses that. Your gross revenue has to be proportional to the amount of wealth. So, and that can be fluid. It's not a set, you know, number. But we just can't loan. For, you can't grow a thousand dollars worth of, you know, pumpkins and sell them at Halloween, and, you know, and get a three hundred thousand dollar house. So, yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Um, in terms of wanting to put up a, a actual packing shed, a makeshift. Yeah. Uh, that has walk-in cooling capacity, um, less than fifty thousand uh, dollars. You said yeah, that storage loan program. I'm just wondering, kind of where would that type of thing fit in to a program? Sure. Um, so, an actual packing shed. So, so we can go. I'm thinking you went way over fifty thousand dollars, right? No. No. Okay. 
So depending on what it is, so I would say like high tunnels, greenhouses, we're probably going to put you in the, the operating loan program. And what that's going to do, just for uh, collateral, you know, uh, useful life of the collateral, that's the term I'm searching for. So we're, that's like a seven year repayment. That's what we're going to, we're going to probably gear you towards there. But if you have more of a permanent structure, then you can go into the direct farm ownership microloan program for $50,000. And that would have an amortization over 25 years. Um, and then the benefit of that is basically we can we don't need an appraisal if it's under fifty thousand dollars. We can do the appraisal internally as farm service agency, so you don't have to incur those costs or those costs don't need to be incurred. Plus, that's timely generally to give owner an appraisal. Um, and so, other than that, does that kind of answer your question? So this this micro loan program. It could cover building improvements, yep, permanent improvements. Um, a larger structure, and I'll get into it a little bit, um, and you can specifically walk in coolers, <coughs> permanent handling. That's where the farm store facility loan program can help you out. And they're totally different. I mean, they're funded from different sources. Agent, farm service agency covers in bulk, but um, the rules are one, one, one uh, person writes this for rules, and the other person writes the rules for this program. So they're totally different. They have different, you know, quote unquote hoops to jump through, but um, they're really targeting um, cold storage producers and uh, specialty crop producers with the farm storage facility loan program. And so, you know, you can purchase your coolers there, your handling equipment. Um, I think I got, and I got a fact sheet on that too. Wash, wash tubs, um, things like that. Um, I can't rip them off all the top of my head. So the, the microloan direct ownership program would cover the structure, and then you'd have to also apply them for the storage. Uh, not necessarily. If you just if you want to do build structure and brand new from scratch, you could go. You could build the structure, coolers, everything in the farm storage is looking for. But if you thought you'd be better off in the the farm loan program part. That, um, you could go as much as you can get done there, I guess, as well. Or you could partner, um, but but if you this, the larger structure, building the structure, buying the coolers, handling the equipment, um, if you wanted to do all that and just want to do it in one shop, I'd probably get, send you to the farm storage facility loan program, the FSFL program. That one has a down payment requirement of 15 percent, so that's. Maybe may or may not be cost prohibited, um, <coughs> but if it is, then you probably land over in the farm loan program part. So there's some differences depending on your plan, and uh, I, I kind of heard, you know, I kind of hear that as a theme too. It's just a lot of it is, what's your plan? We'll tell you where you fit. <laughs> and I know that sounds bad, but but uh, the best thing to do is come. This is what I want to do, and then we'll say, that's great. It might not work here, and then we might have to change one part, or, or we might not change any of it. <laughs> but, um, but what doesn't sound great when you come in is saying, "This is I want to do this. How much money can I get?" So, we that that's I can tell you, well, we'll loan three hundred thousand dollars, but we don't hand you a check for three hundred thousand dollars and say this is what it's due. That's not how it works. So, so we just ask that you have a plan and. Uh, and go from there. So. Uh, fulfilling a need. This is this is mostly just selling the microloan program. So it's who it's the, the microloan program um, and can take the place of high interest credit cards. So if you're fine, you know you're a beginning farmer and you're buying all these initial startup costs and things like that. You're putting on credit cards. You're uh, um, you know kind of taking a hit there, paying all these high interest rates. It's much better to pay 2.625% and uh, and get a cost break there. Um, <coughs> transitions are used loan borrowers into into regular credit programs. Um, if you have limited experience, we have a bridge. So um, our typical operating loan program, you have to have participated for one business cycle in the farm operations. You don't necessarily have operated for one business cycle. You have participated. You know it's like. This way, we can help somebody if they have a mentor arrangement. We can help them out with the operating. Um, it's a way to start new businesses, and it's a way to get beginning farmers to help them improve the land through season extension. Um, and this just goes into purposes. 
this is, you know, I, this is some of its used material, but I, I fill it size here, hoop houses and high tunnels to extend the growing season. Um, we've used that to market since uh, the market loan program started. So um, that's, that's one of the big things that when it first came out was to, uh, to highlight helping with high tunnels. I did notice on uh, Hummert's flyer, they had uh, qualifies for the EQIP program with NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. So the, the, uh, the operating microloan program is a really good complement to the EQIP program that NRCS um, provides. So NRCS will provide some cost share for the EQIP program. We come in with our low interest rates and, and cover the rest. So then you get a really low cost way to put up your high tunnel um, that way. So, so that's just uh, just an idea throwing that out there. But that's a way that you can work with two USD agencies, often co-located, so it's still one building. But uh, if you're not afraid of paperwork, that's a good way to do it. Um, more, that's more helped time. a lot of people. What? E Equip takes takes too long to develop, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, so I don't work specifically in RCS, but I think there's a couple funding seasons. So you apply and then you wait and see if you get funded and you may or may not, and then you go from there. So uh, one thing you could do is get your loan through us, see if you get the money. If you get the money, we get we get it because we're not going to fund, uh, you're not going to get two benefits. It's kind of a duplicate benefit thing. But if you do get your money, then you pay back on your loan. But in the meantime, you're, you're already built and you still got the benefit of the equipment because your loan isn't being paid. Has NRCS changed the requirement that you cannot purchase the material until you're approved? Yeah, that, he's right. Okay, yeah. I think, that's I think that. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, again, it's a, you can't not, put it up not an NRCS approved. employee, no. but it's not buying before it's approved. You can't put it up before you can't put it up. Yeah, it was when it starts. It is that way now. Okay. 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 Or it's sewer county. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah disclaimer, talk to NRCS before you uh, take my advice. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Any other questions? And I will add delivery vehicles. And because I heard, uh, uh, I try to pick up as much as I can too when I come to these. But I heard the Russ's uh, produce uh, manager say that you needed a delivery vehicle. And that's kind of a recognized need. Um, so you could use this for delivery vehicle. You can use the micro loan, operating loan program. And um, every once in a while I get involved in some of the national discussions on the farm storage to loan program. And that's their next move for that loan program is to expand. They've, they've expanded the hops and the yogurts and the cheeses and the milk and the maple syrup and, and, hop and those types of things. And now their next move is into delivery vehicles. So, they reckon they're trying. They're listening and they're trying to find out where the needs are, and uh, and they've recognized you know delivering vehicles as a need to get get these these specialty products to market. So I want to interject real yeah. quick. Um, he said something that tied in well with Ross's and a firm belief I have, but I didn't even think about when we did season extension. We were thinking of getting the crops, stretching it out to make more money, but. Selling the product is huge, and you heard um, Russ's telling you that they're willing to take product that's not quite the way the big guys do. But you hear Andy Daniels is using a hydro cooler, and that's not new technology. I mean, we were doing that back in the 1980s here, and we had a hydro cooler, and it's a flush cooler. And all you're doing is you harvest the product at at peak flavor. You flush it with like 33 degree Fahrenheit water to pull the field temp out. And we built a special cooler on the north part of campus that was designed to take field heat right out of that produce. Now you hear Russ's is being nice enough to do that. But I'm seeing now, you're standing here telling me we could actually take care of your problem by getting you a cooler. You could maybe get a hydro cooler and why should we be, okay, we're local, we're not as good as the big boys. Now all of a sudden we've elevated ourselves. So listening to what he says, a micro loan is fascinating because the hydro coolers, you could buy one in that twenty, thirty thousand dollars dollars range easy. You can get a cheap one. Uh, and then you can get refrigeration systems. And now all of a sudden, not only can we grow with the season extension tool, but now we can market something really high. So I'm sorry, you're just, you're just awesome. doing an awesome job. 
and now delivery vehicles with refrigeration in it. There you go. We got it all made, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we hear anybody here, you know, these, most of these crops require irrigation. So either irrigation or uh, even even digging an irrigation well. I just point that out. But that's something we can find. Um, so this is our brand new direct farm ownership microloan program. So this is actually used to purchase real estate. Um, it can work with all our within the confines of all our existing programs. Basically, it's just under fifty thousand dollars or less. Um, the one thing I will point out here is, um, in addition to the one year of experience, you have to have three years of participating in the business operations for the last uh, the last ten. So, um, again, it's not uh, actually filing a Schedule F income tax return, having farm income expenses, but that's actually being involved and making some level of management decisions on that farm. So. So you know what you can get into, and, and I'm sure, you, and that's why we love people that come to these kind of classes, go to the farm beginning stuff, work with Sayer, those type of programs because they know exactly what they're getting into. I'm sure you can appreciate somebody watched an episode on TV and then wonders, and then they call us up and say, "How much can I get?" So we uh, we want we want uh, we want educated and, and people with a good plan. And, and have researched every option and say, this is what I want to do. How can you help me, how can you help me accomplish that? So, so just like uh, the direct uh, micro operating microloan program, we can get 50000 for this loan program, and, and, and you can get both hand in hand another 50000 for the real estate. No appraisal required. That puts some time off because we can do that ourselves. Um, we still need to close through title insurance. So what that makes sure is that we, you got clear title of property. We have our correct lien. There's no... Uh, no legal issues associated with that property, so we could could avoid that requirement. That does there is a fee for that, but that that's something that's still required. And then the most we can go is a 25-year amortization of that. Um, and then this just covers the 10 years, and it kind of covers the uh, the direct operating loan carbon and loan business cycle. And we can use an apprenticeship to kind of make cover that. Um, if you had a youth loan, we can use your youth loan cover um, any however long you've had successfully repaid that youth loan, we can cover your three of your ten years that way, and that's kind of an expansion for the direct FO microloan. Um, securing microloans, so this is the other, you know, I said there's a reduced application requirement, um, but the also is there's some security flexibilities. So typically, if, if the blanket statement would we, we need to be 100% secured, and then we go and get whatever security hit or collateral, excuse me, you know, more common, that you have available up to 150%. So if you're just getting an annual operating loan, for, uh, we'd, we'd still do that. But part your first 100% is your, your production. So that's fairly straightforward. And then if you have anything else, we can take that up to 150%. If you're just getting a term microloan, maybe for a piece of equipment, we can just take that equipment and that'll be our security. Or if it's just easier, say, hey, I need to get a loan to fix fence and I know there's no collateral there, but I want it turned out over seven years, but you can have a lien on this tractor, you know, that's just, we, we have that ability to do that kind of flexibility there. Um, or in the other loan programs, we don't have that kind of flexibility. Um, in, the micro, in the farm ownership microloan program, um, as long as we get to 100% security, we stop there, we don't keep reaching for 150%. So, so that's just, uh, just some of the more flexibilities we have there with that loan program compared to some, other, some others, so. Again, it's just a reduced application requirement. Um, I'll just give my blanket statement. Um, so it is government paperwork, but you know, if, if the uh, it's probably a quarter or a third of what a regular application was, and I don't think the regular application is that bad. If you filled in, if you have a business plan that says this is what I plan to grow, these are my income, these are my expenses. Um, the rest of what we're trying to get is basically your name and contact information and. The authorities to run credit reports and things like that. That's just legalese. Um, if you have a good farm business plan, you, you've already had, you've already done most of the work. Is there, is there a website or a place a uh, person could go to to research these different opportunities yes. that are available? Yes. Uh, the easiest, you, you know, www.fsa.usda.gov. And then look for farm loan programs. Search for farm loan programs in there. <coughs> oh yeah, great. If you pay your loan off early, is there any kind of penalty? Nope, no prepayment penalties at all. 
How's your question? Did they offer these many loans on pre-removal, like the cedars problem, the red, uh, the eastern red cedar? Um, I'm familiar with that. Actually, there was, and I haven't heard much about it lately, but the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture out in Curtis, <coughs> it was, you know, cedar tree infestation. Um, we were partnering with some of their students so we, they could loan for a piece of equipment, usually like a skid loader or something, yeah. to remove these trees. The rub is they have to use that loader as part of their existing farming operation. Because so we're here to get farmers to get started starting production agriculture, not run a small business that's ag related. So there's kind of a distinction there. So if you just got a skid loader to remove trees and you're charging people to remove their trees. That kind of runs outside of our program because it's more of a That's small business. But if you have you use your piece of equipment as part of your farming operation and to supplement your farming operation, you remove trees. <laughs> that works. <laughs> so, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> just that guy gets driven to haul it back and forth. Right? Yeah. Both places, right? So, but. As, as always, we can't run afoul of NRCS and your conservation plan for your farm and things like that, too. So you want to make sure you're in compliance with them. Okay, and then and then I kind of want to draw a distinction here as we kind of shift into the Farm Storage Facility Loan Program. And I think this program, even more than when I thought I came in here, has a, has a little more run to it. And this might, be, this might hit home with this group a little more. But um, this program... So it's a totally different funding environment, totally different rules, totally different um, everything except the pro but you'll work with the same people. So the distinction here is that you'll have to do 15% down. You come in and you give us quotes on your project. And then before you start anything, and this is we're very much like NRCS in that regard, and it's even emphasized more and more with the rule changes they've made in the last year. Before you accept delivery materials, before you start any site prep, come in and submit your application and talk to us first. Because before you do any action, and, and I'll write down a site prep and deliver materials, and we've had this happen a lot now, we have to come out there and do an environmental inspection. And if we say, if we, we go out there, you can send it in and we can go out there that afternoon and you say, oh, this, this ground has been prepped. And we say, well, you're not, we can't do an adequate environmental inspection. And that's, that's, that's been handed down to us this last year so we just want to make sure that if you got a plan even if you think i'm thinking about doing this i'm not 100 percent sure come out quick do environmental inspection we can get that out of the way and once we have the environmental inspection done then we've got a path to approval but we want to make sure we get that done before any actions happen before ideally it all be approved and then you start your project but, but basically bring in your quotes and we can loan up to 85 percent of the project depending on what it is um, if it's $100,000 or less, our, our security is your facility. So if it's a between $100,000 and $250,000, then, um, or if it's, if it's over $100,000, we need additional security. If it's between $100,000 and two fifty, dollars we can go the 10-year term. And if it's um, above $250,000, then we can go up to a 12-year term. So kind of, you know, spreading out your costs a little bit. Um, just I just put the current rate, but it's 2.125 on a seven-year term right now. So comparable rates to what we're offering on the farm loan program side as well. Um, so eligible commodities. Um, so our traditional grains. So this this is the program that puts if you've probably heard of it puts up a lot of grain bins. Um, but it also does hay. It um, <coughs> seeds and humans, we don't do a lot of we have, we could do re renewable biomass. But honey, milk, meat, poultry, that was a new one. These are all new. Butter, eggs, cheese, yogurt, hops, and many more. I just kind of listed those. But fruits and vegetables, I got those up there. At the top, I missed those already. But, um, but and, and then even, it's even written now. They wrote, wrote it back in the program that if you think there's something that you should be able to store that's not listed or not eligible at this time, make the request and you can probably have it. So they really want to expand the use of this program. Um, so eligible facilities include cold storage facilities, walk-in, uh, prefabricated, permanently installed cold storage coolers, permanently affixed equipment necessary for cold store storage. So the, this, historically it's been permanent, permanently affixed storage and handling equipment, 
that's why it's the development part is the delivery vehicle part because that would not at all be permanently affixed. So that's the line they're crossing when they're trying to get that expanded in this program. But they see the need and they want to get there. So um, this is the one I wanted to get to, but like cold dip tanks, food safety related equipment, sorting bins, ice machines, um, refrigeration systems. Um, trying to picture your, the hydro cooler, but um, something like that, that's all eligible uh, for cold storage. So, yeah. Can you do multiple loans that sum up to the half million, or is it one time up to a half million? So it's it's one time per 500,000 per standalone structure. So we've done, you know, one building here, one building here, you know, so you can have as many 500,000 structures you can support. You have to have the storage need for it. Um, that's one of the things that we've really um, worked worked on the last two or three years. They have worked on this nationwide, is just especially for gold storage. It's really straightforward to put a grain bin and say, "This is your production. Well, you can start up to two years. This is how big a bin you qualify for." And it's really hard when you grow ten different, you know, fruits and vegetable crops and how it works. So they've really rolled that. I want to say back a little bit, added a lot more flexibilities. Um, if you're generally doing a big, uh, you know, a cooler, like a walk-in cooler structure, we leave room for, you know, to work, the handling area and things like that. Um, it might be an oversimplification. We just got to make sure when you build a structure, you don't leave room for a basketball floor. You know, that's, that's excessive. That's where we draw the line. We have to scale that back. But, you know, handling, working areas, that's, that's fine. Uh, as long as your cooler so. Well, I see assumption everyone wants to use these loans to build a basketball court or, you know, going back to my initial question, um, as an urban farmer, that's one of the prejudices that I run into as soon as I start talking to someone about having a uh, farm in the inner city. Um, it's not looked at the same as an urban farmer, kind of like you come back talking about building a $300,000 home on an acreage. Yeah. Normally people, if I'm a rural guy, a guy isn't going to come back at me the same way about, if I'm asking them about building a farm in a, on a piece of property I have, they're not going to come back and talk to me about building a $300,000 home, they're going to talk to me about building a farm. So in the case I'm talking to you, I bring back to you. I'm not talking about building a home, a basketball court, or anything else like any other rural farmer. The only thing I'm talking about is building a farm. So it's understood if I want a $300,000 home in an urban area, I'll buy it. That I won't be trying to use farm aid or uh, farm, farm services, services to do yep. that. I, and I think that's one of the prejudice that urban farmers got to deal with when they start going through agencies and services. People have a preconceived notion they want a house yeah, rather than a farm. And, and I don't, like I said, that's my, that's my, honestly, that's my cookie cutter presentation example that I give to every single person. So, well, and it's, it's in the role, because we don't see urban ag isn't an acreage problem. We, with the acreage is, uh, problems we have is, you know, out west a little bit. Well, you said acreage, and I happen to be urban with acreage, so uh -oh. when you're talking about building a house, you know, directly responding to a question I ask, I do believe you're talking directly to me, which uh -oh. is, you know, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'm, I'm talking I'll tell about you. it because, you know, I went through the high, uh, the equip program, okay. and um, it was like a nightmare. Yeah. trying to get through there because, you know, I wasn't looked at the same as the rural farmers that were trying to participate in the program. And I was treated totally different because I was an urban farmer within city limits. And see, those are some of the stigmas that... Well, you're running into one other problem which I run into all the time and is in urban farming, the, the ag farming area doesn't have the zoning issues like the urban farming does. So now we're starting to get legality issues crossing paths. And so that's been a problem. And I know I've interacted with the, the federal uh, equip group because people want to put high tunnels in Lincoln. 
and for a long time you couldn't do that because they're not permanent structures and so then they start running into safety and liability reasons and so then that's where we got these two governments running into and unfortunately what Paul's talking about is the same problem I ran into when I bought my acreage we bought 25 acres and we wanted to put a greenhouse business and ag production on but they wanted to charge my taxes for residential and it took me uh, 17 years to finally get a green belt exemption on and we separated the land 17 years so I feel your pain and I, I feel bad for it but yeah anytime you have somebody that messes it up for everybody else you and I and everybody well, this, I mean, yeah, this isn't even yeah, yeah this yeah. isn't even dealing with the um, intergovernmental issues that you're um, yeah. communicating this is just dealing with the papers farm service agents or yeah. NRCS and just being looked at differently because this is a farm in the urban yeah. area and that's just not something that's traditional. So this is a great point he's making and just make sure that everybody's on board and you have university, you have uh, Casey and you have all of us and that's one thing we ran into when greenhouses first came to the Lincoln area was if you see a few like Pinky Gardens, <laughs> if you ever go out there you'll see bows on their greenhouse at two foot increments before we were able to educate city of Lincoln that you don't need a structure that's going to put a Sherman tank on top of it, you know. They just were more worried about the issues of it blowing away. So, um, unfortunately, the pain you're going through is something that everybody has to work together in order to educate. And unfortunately, you're going to be a pioneer in... Oh, yeah. no problem so, with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. anyway, let's go on and finish up here yep. and then... No, and, and I will and one of the initiatives that's going on uh, is that there's, it's called a Bridges to Opportunity, and it's kind of a pilot program. It's piloted in five states. Um, Nebraska's just getting started, and we're piloting in the southwest part. Um, but one thing we've learned, and I mentioned that I work, I, my contact with Casey with the Nebraska Beginning Farmer Network, um, the farm loan program specifically, and I, and, and and I hope you won't counter this, but if you do, feel free to call me. We're a little, we're further along than I think NRCS is, and we've learned through this bridge to opportunity that when we're making contact with other agencies, uh, working with other groups, identify even even SARE, National, you know, Sustainable Egg Society, <coughs> different agencies, we're much more more further along in in our cooperation and our partnerships, and because we've reached out to these groups, we had in the past, uh, before 12 years ago. Uh, but, but we've had issues, and so we focus on eliminating those issues. And like you said, you know, and, and that's, you know, I kind of gave you a blank stare when you're like, well, what's the difference between urban and rural? Well, I, you know, after 12 years ago, at least, when I started, you know, we we're to all I've been brought up in as a culture is like, absolutely not, there is no distinction. But I know that that probably hasn't always been there in the past. So. So I don't mean to give you a blank stare that, that why would that exist because it shouldn't exist. I, I sure hope it doesn't. If you have a farm loan experience that does, let me know or, or let anybody know and I'll my car. But that shouldn't exist, especially in the farm loan part, especially you know within our reach. And, and I use the acreage example, but my acreage example probably isn't anything you're thinking about. I was in Ogallala in North Platte. So North Platte has a railroad community. So everybody, I, everybody, and I'll, so I'll give a blanket statement. But everybody works the railroad and wants to own a, you know, have have livestock or something. But they also, North Platte is all these, around the river, all these acreages pop up. And so it's a house and three acres. They say, well, I need a loan for this house. They say, well, we're the farm service agency. We don't loan for houses. They say, well, there's five acres of grass out there. I can put three cows out there. You know that's that's my experience, and that's the only rub. And I and I only do and I, I present it that way. And it's not that we're here to have barriers, and I'm not doing a very good job of marketing because my job is to get you guys into the office and then find out what works or not. But I just kind of want to draw. This is this is the other side of the line, and this is the good side of the line, and this is what doesn't work. You know, so you know kind of where the line is. So that's why I give the basketball hoop example or the acreage example. The big one we have with the farm storage facility loan program is machine shed, right? So I want to build a flat storage structure, but I really need a machine shed for all my tractors. Well, that's not the loan program before. So that's not an urban egg problem, but but that's the big one we have. So that's how you machine shed basketball hoop. So things like that. So 
Then last thing, and then I'll, I'll do my waiver on this one too, but um, I have a good friend that uh, never takes me out to lunch, but should. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the cubicle over, but he's in charge of the NAP program. And basically, the non-insurance assistance program is um, kind of provides insurance for the Farm Service Agency where traditional RMA insurance does not cover. So it's a risk management tool. It, um, it might entice your lender to say, I have some level of insurance there. Um, <coughs> I'll use his example. So, um, But he said NAP used to stand for not a penny because it was catastrophic loss coverage and it rarely ever paid. Um, but they changed that with the 2014 Farm Bill. You can have actually buy up coverage, and it's much more cost effective program, and much more available. So it's a traditional crop fee is $250 per crop. But like I said, you guys might be producing multiple, multiple crops. So the most is 750. So you have four, three or four or five crops. It caps out at 750 per county. Yeah. Do you have questions? Uh, does that cover fruit trees and vegetables, or I don't know. Um, I was told earlier year. by an insurance salesman. I, I was told earlier out. in the year the so government was backing a program that would cover fruit trees, fruit and vegetables. Okay, I'm not for sure if that's NAP or something else, but there is a NAP. Like I said, I'm a little out of my area here, but I didn't want to pass the opportunity to pass this along. But there is a fact sheet on it too, and you can call me and I'll put you in touch with. Uh, uh, Seth, and he'll make sure I get taken right. out to lunch. Okay. I hate to bring up weather, especially with you, Stacy. But we were in the Pilgrim tornado, and when I tried for that, they said no, because you had to have three years of proof of your crops. I think it's changed. I wonder, has it changed at all? I call. Yeah, they said no, we they had to have a six crop. Row crops have their yields, so if we don't keep all that record. They won't be able to pay you. Yeah, so you have to have, it's, it's a, it's always a, no different than any other shares, you have to have the records. You need to check on that because with the 2014 Farm Bill, the NAP coverage has changed quite a bit. It's a totally it's different program. program. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to do due diligence checks on that. Yep. And I believe there is an early sign-off date too, maybe March 1. Yep. Yeah, and, and not to duck them, but I, I, I just want to make everybody available, and then that's as much as I know. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have the, you know, individual crops. I got the overall, what the, the your, what we draw for the whole thing. Uh, if you had to have the individual crops, it wouldn't be any good. Okay. Good that's good Yeah, if it, and though that's helpful, and like I said, Good contact your offices. It's like, and you, you probably said it better than I could, and that's the point I want to get across. If you're familiar with what it used to be, it's totally different now. It may it may help you. So, so then when we get a chance to present to groups like this, we won't we don't want to pass up that opportunity. And then this just goes into the buy up coverages and things like that. So, and like I said, there's fact sheets out there with my card. Um, and that, that's all I really have. If anybody has any questions, I think we got a lot of them throughout, and I appreciate that. But I don't want to leave without anybody getting getting their question answered. And we blended a lot of home programs and started to make them exciting and not get the rules convoluted. But if you take home anything, it's that we're willing to help. I, I really do believe that. And uh, we probably have a loan program that fits your needs. You just got to find out what it is. So.